New phone. Yeah, hey. Yeah, I got a new phone. Yeah, I know. It's cool. It's brand new. Totally latest model. Uh, all right. Yeah, I'll see you next week. August 17th, 1940. For the past few hundred years, the news would most often be exactly the opposite. But this week, Britain loses a colony. I'm Indy Nidell. This is World War II. Last week, Adolf Hitler was making ever more concrete plans for an invasion of the Soviet Union next year. Though some of his intelligence was dangerously faulty. There were Luftwaffe attacks on Allied shipping each day around Britain, and the Italian army invaded British Somaliland. They took a couple of towns, but had, however, yet to engage the British forces. And that happens this week on the 11th. The Attacking Italian force is made up of five colonial brigades, three black shirt battalions, three banda groups, a hundred armored fighting vehicles, including 27 tanks and at least 20 big guns. And they head towards the plains some 60 miles from Berbera, the capital. The enemies meet at the Tug Argan Gap. The British outnumbered by as much as 15 to one. Their force is a Rhodesian regiment, the Second African Rifles, the Black Watch, two Punjabi companies, the local Camel Corps, and the first East African Light Battery, a European, African, and Asian mix of units, but a small one. The fighting lasts for five days, and in spite of stiff resistance that repels advance after advance, the numbers eventually begin to tell, and positions which the Italian army's waves of assault cannot take are instead slowly encircled. The British withdraw, but they do so gradually, from one hill to another, fighting all the while. This is in order to slow the Italians to cover the evacuation from Barbara, where the Royal Navy has rigged up an Altai jetty, to Aden. First the civilians, Abyssinians, Arabs, Indians, and Somalis, and then the administrative officials leave British Somaliland. The troop evacuation begins the 16th at 1 in the afternoon and lasts until the following afternoon. This is unhindered by the Italian army, some of whom are fairly roughly mauled at Barcassan by the Black Watch, who are left behind to cover the evacuation. The roads are swamped with rain, though, which thwarts a rapid Italian advance. The Italians have, however, been able throughout the campaign to coordinate columns of men separated by large distances of desert. The British take a total of 33 killed and 220 wounded or missing in the fighting, and the Italians as many as 10 times that. Italian troops will enter Berbera the 19th, and Benito Mussolini will annex British Somaliland to Italian East Africa. Mussolini brags that he has conquered territory the size of Britain. And for Britain, losing a colony, any colony, is a serious PR disaster. The evacuation comes as a shock to the British public. I mean, I mean, right in the middle of the Battle of Britain to one enemy, and they lose a whole colony to another? Winston Churchill, who, remember, is not just prime minister, but also defense minister, is furious. The defense cannot be played up in the papers as, as super heroic because of the small number of casualties. And he criticizes General Archie Wavell, Britain's Middle East commander-in-chief, claiming the men hadn't mounted a strong defense. Wavell disagrees supports the withdrawal as a textbook withdrawal in the face of far superior numbers, and cables Churchill that a big butcher's bill was not necessarily evidence of good tactics. Adolf Hitler opines that it's a tough blow for the British, sure, but more emotionally than militarily. And one contemporary writer writes that all they had lost was the privilege of maintaining an expensive garrison in their least valuable colony. Well, not really because by taking British Somaliland, the Italians now control the southern entrance to the Red Sea. And what is to stop them from sweeping into Sudan? Britain is certainly going to try. And also this week, between Britain and Italy, the RAF bombs the Fiat Works in Turin and the Caproni Works in Milan. And on the 17th, three British battleships bombard the Italians at Bardia. But Britain really has its hands full with the Germans, their aerial attacks, and the possibility of being invaded. Hitler declares a total blockade of the British Isles the 17th. Any neutral ships there may be sunk on sight. Germany also introduces long-range Condor planes for maritime use from their bases near Bordeaux. For the month of August, German U-boats sink 56 ships for 267,000 tons. The British, though, managed to sink a U-boat with a depth charge dropped by a plane on August 16th. 
This is the first time that happens. Also, the British changed their naval codes in August. This is a bit of a setback for Beadienst, the German cryptography service. So far, they've been pretty good at getting up-to-date and useful intelligence from British transmissions. Germany's Adlertag, Eagle Day, the kickoff of their campaign to try to destroy the British Air Force, was postponed last week to this week. The Day of the Eagle, August 13, 1940, launched Germany's fourth campaign in less than a year. But unlike the three previous attacks on Poland, Scandinavia, and France and the Low Countries, this one was an air attack without any ground-based activity at all. From the outset, the Germans were surprised by the skill of the British pilots who opposed them. As we've seen, though, there have been attacks by the Luftwaffe virtually every day this month, and the Germans have been having setbacks. And a lot of that has to do with spreading the attacks too wide. If you look at August 12th, right, this is a typical operation. They attack RAF airfields, shipping in the Thames, the Portsmouth Harbor, and some coastal radar stations. All of that. Okay, not an entirely typical day, since this was the only time they go for the radar stations, which to me is a fairly serious oversight, but anyhow. Germany loses 31 planes, Britain 22. On actual Eagle Day itself, in a night raid on a Spitfire factory, Germany loses 45 planes and the British 13. But six of the British pilots from those planes are saved to fight another day. Adlertag is disappointing to the Germans, so they attack an even larger force the 15th, with 520 bombers and 1,270 fighters crossing the channel between 11.30 and 6.30, many even coming from Denmark and Norway. The Luftwaffe will call this Black Thursday, though, since the losses are so heavy, 75 to 34. Heck, Luftflotte 5 from Scandinavia loses 20% of its strength. They will not be brought back into the battle after this. The RAF can't exactly be jubilant, though, since they lose a lot of planes and men as well, not just in the skies, but the men and women on the ground in the airfields that keep the Air Force running. In fact, in the first few days of the official campaign, Germany loses nearly 200 planes. But spoiler, in the first 10 days, 100 British aircraft are destroyed on the ground in addition to the many dozens in the skies. Luftwaffe Command believes their loss is acceptable and that they, unlike the British, can replace them. Well, to an extent, the losses are high enough that already on the 15th, Luftwaffe Chief Hermann Goering begins making changes to plans and even personnel. People who doubt the overall operation, like veteran flying ace Theo Osterkamp, are promoted out of the way and young firebrands like Adolf Galland take their place. Goering's plan for phase three of the battle is going to be hit the airfields. Already this week on the 14th, though, after going through the Luftwaffe's Enigma messages, British intelligence begin to realize that Germany has made no concrete decision about invasion, nor will there be until the fight for aerial supremacy is decided. A lot happened the 14th, actually. U.S. President Franklin Roosevelt agrees to give the British 50 destroyers if the U.S. can use British bases in the Western Atlantic and Caribbean. This is not yet made public, and it won't be official until September 2nd. Also, there is tension between Greece and Italy. It's been building up for a while, but the sinking of the Greek cruiser Helle by an Italian sub has made things worse. The Greek army partially mobilizes. And there is news from one country I have not mentioned very often, Luxembourg. Gustav Simon, running the German occupation there, has begun a vigorous campaign of Germanization. Speaking French is outlawed, and posters reading things like your language is German and only German are widespread. Family names are Germanized, but resistance is equally vigorous. A revival of the Luxembourgish language flourishes, and the Spengelkrieg, the war of pin badges, begins around now, as citizens begin prominently wearing patriotic lapel badges. This prompts attacks from the collaborationist Volksdeutsche Bewegung, the only political movement allowed by the invaders, whose aim is to incorporate the duchy into the Reich. Local resistance groups form as the summer rolls on. And the week comes to its end, with Italian success in British Somaliland and Eagle Week in the skies over Britain. Also this, on the 17th, a tally is made of British losses since the beginning of the war. 8,266 sailors, 4,400 soldiers, 729 civilians from air attacks, and pilots and aircrew killed or missing, 3,851. 
Those numbers may pale in comparison to, say, the French. The Battle of Britain is just getting started. John Keegan has something to say that fits that battle as it's been fought so far. Fighter Command fought the Battle of Britain on something like equal terms. It would manage to keep 600 Spitfires and Hurricanes serviceable daily. The Luftwaffe would never succeed in concentrating more than 800 Messerschmitt 109s against them. Nevertheless, the Luftwaffe might have established the air superiority by which its powerful force of bombers could have devastated Britain's defenses had it operated from the outset to the same sort of coldly logical plan by which the German army had attacked France in 1940. On the contrary, it had no considered strategy and fought fighter command instead by a series of improvisations, all posited on Goering's arrogant belief that Britain could be brought down on its knees by any simulacrum of a hard blow that he directed against it. But will such arrogance be well-placed? Or will such strategy come? And if so, will it prevail? What will phase three of the Battle of Britain hold? Tune in in future weeks of World War II in real time to get the answers. If you want to know more about Italy's fascist government and Mussolini's colonial ambitions, check out our Between Two Wars episode that covers just this right there. Our Time Ghost Army member of the week is Richard Newman. His contribution and your others, are the only things that keep this show running. So do like Richard and support us at timeghost.tv or patreon.com. Subscribe, ring that little bell. See you next time.